Okay, so that was great. We'll have um, now a Q&A session and there are microphones on either side of the room. If you'd like to take a step up. Oh, go ahead, okay. Um, my question is, um, phrase for Dr. Lee, but I'd love input from anyone else if, you, if you're interested. Um, it concerns the relevance of recent findings um, on how early life experiences shape and change the brain. Um, I'd like to know what aspects of childhood background you believe might be significant for women affected by incarceration in their health, um, how those factors are currently included in research, and what you think might or should be done in the future, um, maybe assuming unlimited resources or really, really good data. Yeah. Um. So I mean, I mean, I think from a life course perspective, either from sociology or life course epidemiology, of course, there are many things that can impact. There are critical periods from pre-birth, um, from it, you know, from behaviors mothers engage in, all the way down to when they're experiencing the uh, incarceration of a family member that might impact their health. And so, in terms of the kind of data set we'd want, I mean, I think that's similar to what the National Children's Studies what was supposed to be, a, a something where we would have, we'd capture women post um, preconception and be able to follow and be able to collect biological information like lead exposure, like exposure to violence of mothers, et cetera, especially since we know there's intergenerational transmission of um, experiences like prison and violence and um, other forms of inequality. So I mean, I think the, be the best kind of study would be if we could get that off the ground. But in terms of what might be in particular, I don't know, maybe Chris, do you have any things that you might think are more most specifically important? I mean, it would be good to get everything, <laughs> I guess would yeah. be my argument. I mean, I, I guess I think on the most basic level that we just need longitudinal data. Yeah. I mean, I, I think we need repeated measures of health outcomes. We need repeated measures of incarceration. We need measures of other types of criminal justice contact. I mean, I think the degree to which we would even know what other information we wanted, I think is 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 pretty bad until we, we get some studies going where we can adjust for unobservables and other forms of criminal justice contact. So I think for me that would be the next data step I would want. Thank you. Dr. Drucker. Um, I want to share the sentiments. You hear me? Mm -hmm. I want to share the sentiments about how uh, exciting this session, has, this, this whole conference has been for holding these two things together that are so often considered separately. So a couple of general questions, whoever wants to address them. I, Chris, you mentioned being in Denmark and seeing how different the attitude about criminal justice was. I spent a lot of time overseas uh, in, in jails and, in, and with policemen and drug programs. And uh, one of the things that's obvious about the other um, uh, um, successful democracies uh, that um, the services that are available uh, all along the way for children and adult health are uh, so far ahead of ours that they're inseparable from the, uh, in fact, they're part of the same ideology about the use of punishment in those societies and the attitudes about crime. So in thinking about the, the effects of those criminal justice systems on health outcomes, how do you untangle them from, I don't think you can actually, and, or have to, because it's one ecology, but uh, how do you deal with that uh, statistically, looking from place to place? So, and with them increasingly going in the direction of better services and, and more comprehensive preventive programs for health at every level, and are going in the opposite direction, especially for the population that goes to prison, most dramatically seen now in the end of welfare, as we know it, the replacement of uh, welfare with uh, pathology-based uh, eligibility for for support services, the uh, you know the SSID, um, so that that's that's a general kind of question. Yeah, I mean, I think you know it's a really interesting thing um, because so many of the things that we talk about as mattering a lot and needing to change in terms of population health in the U.S. are stable, <laughs> especially in Scandinavia, right? I mean, you just. So um, another reason my RAs got annoyed with me is because I kept sending them back to data when they said, oh, this, doesn't, this measure doesn't change at all in you know, Norway over this period. And I was like, no, 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 go. Cool. <laughs> and you know, I mean, I do think it makes it really hard statistically because there are all these things that don't change much at all in those countries and we don't approach those levels. So 
I mean, I think there could certainly be lots of other things that are driving the relationship that I, that I pointed out. But it may be the threshold effect of the level of, of criminal justice, the use of the criminal justice system to disadvantage people. Yeah. Uh, just a, a footnote in my own public health education going back you know, a couple of hundred years, uh, the, uh, one of the first things I learned about that really impressed me was that Sweden was the first country that anyone looked at closely in which social class, which is quite real there, there are people who make a lot more money, but not the same range. We have I had a friend who was chief of police in Stockholm, and his son was a, a new beat cop, and the difference in the salary level was like four or five fold, whereas in you know, New York, the similar data would be a 50 fold. Anyway, uh, that there was no difference between social class and, uh, and infant mortality rate, hmm. going back to the 1960s in Sweden. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good afternoon. My name is Sharon Parker. I'm from Brown University School of Medicine, Medicine um, Infectious Diseases. I want to commend everyone for the wonderful presentations and thank you for, for gathering this group together. The question that I have is that we provided a lot of information regarding scientific data. How do we take this and translate it back to the community? Mm -hmm. You know, I think that that's uh, something that I've struggled a lot with uh, in particular, and I think our patient, my patients remind me of this day in and day out. Um, while the work that I presented here was really trying to look at kind of how biased uh, our cohort studies are, um, the majority of my work is really focused on kind of uh, outcomes that our patients uh, uh, are most concerned about. So for instance, we just did this study looking at rates of food insecurity. So uh, returning prisoners uh, actually in different states have different levels of, uh, rather depending on what state you have, you have different food stamp bans. Uh, so you know, if you live in Texas and you've been convicted of a drug felony, you never uh, can get a uh, food stamp. Uh, again in your lifetime, whereas in Connecticut, where I currently live, uh, you can still get a food stamp. And so we administered a survey looking at uh, uh, the rates of food insecurity among returning prisoners and to see whether or not uh, there were any associations between food insecurity and HIV risk behaviors. And just like our patients had said in clinic, in fact, there were uh, associations in, again, this very pilot level uh, survey of looking at uh, food insecurity uh, and HIV risk factors, of in, in particular transactional sex, so sex work. Um, and, uh, you know, 91% of those that we surveyed actually reported uh, meeting USDA levels of food insecurity. Uh, and uh, among those that reported not having any food uh, in the day, uh, in the last 30 months, they reported having kind of increased risk for transactional sex and um, other HIV risk behaviors. And uh, the piece of that that I think is the most important is that uh, in this particular study, we used an approach, uh, community-based participatory research uh, approach, where uh, from the very <coughs> beginning, we engaged uh, uh, community organizations to participate in the design, the implementation, and the dissemination of this study. We actually hired former prisoners at Yale to administer the surveys. Uh, and I think that that's the piece of it that um, I often struggle with as a researcher, is how best to disseminate this work. And I have found that at least in one small way is by including community folks and patients in our, uh, in our circumstance in to be involved in the research, to be involved in kind of uh, both the generation of scientific questions, it both betters our science. Uh, the participation rate for this survey study was 91%, uh, incredibly high, uh, as well as the dissemination of the work. And so, you know, as a researcher, I feel less comfortable about, uh, you know, supporting um, current legislation to eliminate these food stamp bans across the state, but all of us are none, and California doesn't. And so, I. Think I think that that's the piece of it is that if science can come uh, uh, in a place with equal participation uh, among community members asking the questions that matter to them the most, uh, that they can both participate in improving the science of what we're doing as well as the dissemination. I think, I mean, uh, uh, often uh, I struggle with this myself, which is how best to balance kind of the science of what we do and then getting the work out there. Um, Ingrid and I were just talking about this, which is that, yeah, it's, and, and Becky too mentions this, which is that, you know, we all know 
uh, that uh, these large national surveys don't include institutionalized populations. They don't represent the U.S. They don't represent black populations. And yet, here we are. We've had these conversations over and over again, and it doesn't move to change. And so, I don't know. I, I would open this to other folks in, in uh, the audience, and if people have other ideas of how better we can kind of think about disseminating, if you have experience. One of the things that I'm thinking about, there are a number of people who's watching this on the web and who are present who may not be researchers, but who work in the trenches with people. And I'm wondering from this conference, from this symposium, what can we provide them with who are on the front lines every day working with these individuals? And that's just something to kind of think about and maybe when other people make comments and may be able to provide that type of information. But I think that's really important that we try to be able to provide something now as we continue to develop the research. Thank you. Hi, my name is Jamie Nelson. I work for the Legislative Corrections Ombudsman. Um, and so we advise the Michigan Legislature on corrections policy and investigate prisoner complaints. And we get a lot of complaints about um, health care and mental health care in the prison system. Um, this conference has been really great because it's gotten me thinking much more broadly about the impacts um, to people that are connected to prisoners and once they come home. Um, and I think it's really, it's staggering how little we follow people once they get out of prison because sometimes I feel like the healthcare system um, is sort of operates in a bubble in the Department of Corrections and it's like these people are going to come home and many of them are going to need assistance after they come home. Um, and so my question is with all the research that's done and all of the national level work that's done, do you think that there are things that individual states can do um, to better track and kind of assist in, in understanding risk and kind of making it a more broad spectrum um, approach? Or does it have to kind of happen at a national level first to track these statistics and get a better understanding of risk and that sort of thing? So, I mean, I guess my impression is it's a hell of a lot easier to get one state to do something really well than it is to get the whole country to do something well, mm -hmm. right? And and so, I mean, I would think that if you had a state that was, that became sort of a model um, in terms of collecting data and monitoring folks and following them in, in ways that help them reintegrate, then, you know, that is the sort of thing that other places could point to if they were trying to do that sort of thing. I mean, I think your stuff is more direct, though, right? You know, one, two ideas that I've had uh, that I think would directly address that, and I think that there are some in the room that are, are, are aiming to do this, is one, each state can propose new measures to the BRFIS each year. Uh, and so that might be at the BRFIS stands for the Behavioral Risk risk factor surveillance, surveillance, system. Surveillance, surveillance system, thank you. <laughs> and so that might be one, one concrete way, is that the Michigan Burfus could actually ask questions about incarceration, family member incarceration, childhood, uh, kind of uh, whether you have children uh, who have parents who have been incarcerated. So mm -hmm. each state can have a Burfus uh, question, and I know that there are certain states that uh, hopefully are trying to add questions about uh, um, getting questions on incarceration on the breakfast. And then the second is, is then this uh, comes to the administrative claims data. So as best as I know that there are only uh, six states in Puerto Rico that have uh, the uh, Department of Corrections data administratively linked already to uh, Medicaid claims data. Uh, and I think that this is an incredibly important piece. I mean, uh, one of the, the big issues with the Affordable Care Act is that 65% of individuals they estimate uh, that are returning home from prison will newly be eligible for Medicaid. Uh, and in this vein, it's imperative, I think, again, just thinking about the public and the taxpayer monies that are going into providing care, that we have a better understanding of what happens in between these large health care systems that care for our most disenfranchised. So uh, to me, it's an incredibly difficult and tedious process to actually get the data linked between uh, two large bureaucratic agencies, in particular ones where they're protected health information. Um, but this would be something that I think uh, Michigan, which I know is not one of the six states uh, that has that, uh, this might be some other way. I know that there are other states that have, uh, for certain research projects or studies, have linked data between Department of Corrections, uh, Medicaid, as well as Department of Labor. But you can imagine that as more coordination happens at the state level, linking these data, your state would be better prepared to really answer policy-relevant questions about how best to allocate resources. Thanks.
Oh, did you? Oh, I was just going to say, and I, I think Megan talked about this too a little bit, and I don't do intervention work. For most of the stuff I do is data analysis, but thinking about um, prison visitation as a point of intervention is something that some people have talked about. I mean, there are long wait periods that might be an opportunity to provide services or at least <laughs> provide um, connections to services and other types of resources. So I don't know if, if there are any pilot programs that are doing that, but I know that's something people sometimes talk about. And I don't want to take uh, too much more time, but I just want to say if there are folks in the School of Public Health here who are doing work specifically with the Department of Corrections in this sort of any of these ways that we talked about, I would really love to talk to you. So thank you. Hi. Thanks for a great conference. My name is Natalie Holbrook. I'm the program director for the American Friends Service Committee's Michigan Criminal Justice Program. Um, I'm a prisoner rights ad, uh, activist and prison reform activist. Um, so my question is, about staff connected to um, the problem of mass incarceration and what do you see the importance of studying health outcomes for people who are directly connected um, on a daily basis in their jobs with the stressful environment of prisons um, in our country? So that's my question. Yeah, I mean, you do. There was one study uh, that I know of, and again, I'm not an expert on this, uh, but recently uh, published, uh, and, and uh, honestly, uh, the um, uh, within the last three years, I would say, uh, that's really looked at kind of uh, correctional uh, um, officers and their risk for poor health outcomes and found that, in fact, uh, similar to our patients, that practicing in stressful environments, practicing in these punitive conditions has a negative uh, uh, health impact on cardiovascular risk factors. And so I, I often, again, as someone that has practiced in prison, uh, in particular think about the health of correctional officers, but in particular the health of the health care providers that are practicing within a system where, again, health care is constitutionally guaranteed, so it means that you must have health care providers behind bars and what that does kind of to the morale uh, as well as your physical and mental health over time. But I think that that is another way of us thinking about how the impacts of incarceration are broader reaching than just, again, the patients, the family members, the children. It also impacts the communities and, and the folks that garner livelihood by this uh, enormous kind of uh, um, industry uh, that has been established in the U.S. So I appreciate that question. And I think that that is one way as a public health community that we can think about, again, uh, getting uh, more um, kind of support around thinking about the negative health impacts of incarceration, that this is something that unions, uh, in particular correctional officer unions, are interested in. Hi, I'm Vicki Johnson Lawrence. I'm uh, at U of M Flint, and I do a lot of epi type work, social epi type work. And the question I have is about the type of care that inmates receive while they're in prison, and whether there are repercussions for not providing the a reasonable level of care while they're imprisoned. And then after those prisoners get out, if there's information that reports their injuries while they're there that state reported, then these prisoners get out, they haven't been well cared for, but they definitely have lingering issues. Could that be part of the reason that we don't, or that the justice systems don't share the information about the health status of prisoners while they're incarcerated? And would that lead to some sort of, would there be some sort of financial penalty that would be instituted to the state or whoever, or however the correction systems are set up, would there be a cost to them if prisoners found out, oh, there is a database that says what was wrong with me, whether or not they received treatment for it? Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, so I think there are a couple of things, and I don't know, Ingrid would be the one who knows this best, I think. So. Maybe I'm getting lots of stuff wrong, but I mean, my impression is just that the capacity for monitoring health data in individual prisons and then linking those data up is good only for outcomes that are so rare that you have to do it pretty infrequently. So the, the mortality data is pretty good, although the cause-specific stuff is really tricky, right, Ingrid? the cause-specific stuff doesn't line up with 
the classifications of death used in the NDI. Um, it, and so I just, I mean, I think there's currently not capacity to do it. I mean, it does seem like things that should be on, you know, the survey of inmates or, or something like that, but I think there are a lot of mental health questions on it right now, but um, it hasn't been linked to, to most physical health conditions. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was the one who made the comment earlier about uh, not being able to get health data from the Department of Corrections. And uh, I, I, sure, sure. Um, yeah, so I think I may have gotten the ball rolling on that by mentioning that uh, it it's been difficult to get health data from the Department of Corrections, although we haven't really pressed as hard as we could. Um, and I think that, I do think that there are health data in the system that are being collected um, and that are used for programming purposes. Um, but I also think that there's a lot of fear around releasing those data um, in part due to like uh, public attention to infectious disease and other issues. So I think there's, I, I think it's, it's like the most politically sensitive type of data that at least from the perception of corrections departments that they have. That's my sense though. No, I'll just add one more thing to that. I mean, there are systems that uh, New Jersey, for instance, the Department of Corrections has had an electronic health record for the past 10 years. Uh, and so it is possible to get data uh, from an electronic health record uh, on the health of individuals that are incarcerated. Uh, the second piece that I will mention is that, uh, again, I, I, as, a, as a researcher, as a physician, I think we just don't have much data on uh, what happens to the health of people that are incarcerated and what happens longitudinally over time. The best data that we do have actually come from data looking at HIV infected individuals where in fact they find that uh, CD4 counts in viral load, so these are measures of uh, HIV, uh, you know, how a person's doing, actually improve uh, when they're incarcerated and significantly deteriorate upon release. And it gets worse by the number of times you're in and out. So the actual number of times that you're incarcerated actually make that worse. And so um, this isn't to say that prison is a healthy place per se, uh, but it does show that at least for individuals that have HIV infection, being incarcerated does improve these disease measures. Hi, um, I'm Mike Reagan. I'm with uh, <clears throat> a federally qualified health center. Um, so I want to thank you for bringing together the sociologists and you scholars uh, in epidemiology as well. I want to echo what uh, your colleague from Brown University talked about. How can you engage us who, I'm not even in the trenches, but the staff I work with are in the trenches. How can you engage us? I think it is important that you engage um, those who are incarcerated and their families. But uh, I'm right now in the state of Michigan, and I won't do my speech. So uh, uh, we're at risk of not expanding Medicaid. We were really hopeful, really, really hopeful that this would begin as an FQHC to help us begin to engage people who come out of prison. Um, because now they come out, um, it is hard to get their health records. It has helped to get continuity of care, and they might have prescriptions for 30 days, uh, no matter what their condition, and they have nothing as a parolee that engages them when they go in and get a slip of paper for a prescription. It is a worthless piece of paper because they can't cash it in. Um, so how can you engage us? Uh, NIDA has just asked us uh, as providers to have input around what research they're going to do around addiction and recovery and prevalence and all the other things, and more important, the competencies we need in our staff to deal in an interdisciplinary way with the multiple conditions that people present. So I'm just asking, what can you do uh, to help engage us as providers and, and across the disciplines that are involved in community health care? So I guess the way, I mean, I guess the way I think about it, and this might not be a satisfying answer, so I apologize, but the way I think about the the stuff that I've done earlier on effects of parental incarceration on kids and the stuff that Hetty's doing now on the effects of family member incarceration on women's health is to say that what you're doing is so important that it actually needs to spill out to additional folks who are high-risk populations 
who aren't even getting the basic services that prisoners get when they're incarcerated, despite the, the fact that they're dealing with essentially the same sort of conglomeration of issues. And, and so for, for me, that's the message that I would like to get to folks like you. I mean, I think the other reason in terms of sort of the bigger picture stuff for doing this sort of work, in, in my opinion at least, is that the average American has very little sympathy for a guy who's cycled through the system. And I, I, maybe I'm wrong. I'm not a, you know, I don't, I don't look at polling data that much, but it, it, my impression at least is that there's not a lot of sympathy. But there is a lot of sympathy for vulnerable kids who haven't done anything wrong and for women who are in love with someone that might put them at greater risk. And so I think about expanding this sort of discussion to the point that people who would have no sympathy for prisoners would actually engage with the idea of penal reform being important for other vulnerable health populations who haven't committed a crime. And so I, for me, that's the way I think about it. I mean, I do almost nothing on the effects of incarceration on the guys who are going through the system. And so that's something that I feel less capable of speaking to. I mean, I also think oftentimes, and I know this is on on being streamed, but academics don't often always ans ask the right questions to answer the types of things that are actually going to be helpful in, in the application process. And so I know at the University of Washington, there's lots of different types of roundtables, so sort of micro versions of this kind of uh, situation where people who are, apply who are applied and are actually working in the trenches are identify the questions that are of interest to them and then link with other individuals who, who are in this, in, the area, in this area, but maybe are asking interesting questions that are relevant and salient, but not necessarily ad exactly addressing the needs of the populations that you serve. So I think this is the beginning of, a, I think, m many more conversations that need to happen, in my opinion, for, to translate academic work in a way that's going to be helpful and improve conditions. But that's my opinion. Yeah. Can I offer an answer to this mm -hmm. important question? Because there's an assumption here that this The question is how, how, you, can, uh, yeah. how you can get engaged in this. Healthcare providers, uh, and typically, th this, there are institutions, organizations of significance that are not healthcare providers and are not prisoners. And those are the prisoner advocacy organizations and discharge service organizations in New York, like Osborne and Fortune and Correction Association, that are very substantial in, in what they can do. Have a steady stream, thousands per year, of people coming out of prison who come to them for services. And instead of waiting for those groups to come to the doctors and the health uh, researchers to, to, add, you know, to, to come to them to do research, turn it around the other way and begin to go proactively out to those organizations and say, how can we help, right. how can we help you in what you see as the problems right. that need to be done? And how can we work together? Because that's as good a place to access this population as any, and it has a support structure that's in place. Mm -hmm. The, the one other thing I might add to that is that, you know, so in uh, my capacity as uh, co-directing the Transitions Clinic Network, we're working with eight uh, federally qualified health centers. And one barrier that we've identified is that oftentimes health care providers have their own kind of concerns and prejudices and worries about working with this population. And so I, I think that an important piece of it also is uh, identifying if there's, uh, you know, having a training for cultural competency of caring for this population, what, you know, many uh, the providers have never stepped foot into prison. They don't realize that, in fact, they're seeing many people that have been incarcerated previously. Uh, and once they realize they ask, they realize that many of their patients are. And so there are those sorts of trainings. Uh, University of California, San Francisco runs one that I'd be happy to share with you later. Thank you. I think we have time for just these last two questions here. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you uh, and that um, I worked in the San Francisco jail as a case manager, discharge planner, and we need more of those people. We need more social workers. We need discharge planners, and most of facilities have none, and that's the first thing to get cut. Um, and we refer people to transitions, but transitions is full. They're, you know, they're the providers are over inundated with patients that are coming in and out of the system, and um, you know, why don't we, get, you know, put our money where 
where people actually who need jobs, who have expertise handling these systems, like the Navigator Project, which is a study through UCSF taking people who are HIV positive and have been formerly incarcerated and connecting them with people and actually showing them where to go, how to use these systems, um, paying them money for the services that they often provide to people um, for free. And that, um, you know, the continuity of care and is crucial. And I just wanted to, you know, second that sometimes jail and prison saves people's lives and they come in extremely sick and it is a great public health, you know, place for intervention. And one thing we haven't talked about, and I wanted to see what your opinion was, that um, the privatization and for-profit healthcare companies that are providing services, um, how do we get people who are trying to just cut costs um, because it's a for-profit company to recognize that the, the, the costs associated with incarceration and health is so much broader? You know, unfortunately, I, uh, again, similar to probably many of us, and, and probably that's uh, uh, kind of always at these academic and public health uh, meetings, those individuals that are working within private health care systems, prison, uh, prisons are not uh, represented. I honestly don't have much experience with that. I do agree with you that discharge planning is a key piece of providing that continuity of care and uh, echo the importance of having people that have shared life experiences navigating individuals from prison or jail back to the community, but I don't have any, uh, uh, you know, any knowledge really or expertise. I find it really that. interesting that Nobody knows really what's going on in private companies, and um, I think we should find out. <laughs> uh, it's very brief. I know we have about five minutes left. Um, if a part of the outcome of this symposium is to figure out how we can incorporate practitioners, I'll be willing to help um, develop that. I brought that question up because I started off as a probation officer, mm -hmm. I started off in mental health in the trenches. Now I'm on the other side doing, excuse me, doing the research. So I kind of understand both sides of it and how do we begin to merge that. Mm -hmm. So my question is a little different, maybe a little easier to answer. I'm interested in doing longitudinal research and working with incarcerated populations. I've worked on many studies before. But the issue is how do you find them? You know, so some of the studies I've worked on, we've done three, six, and 12 month <laughs> follow-ups. And finding them has been very difficult and challenging, and we've had meetings as research team members to figure that out. What advice would you have? That's a harder question. <laughs> so I, I mean, I think, I mean, I don't, I know that there are folks who are using sort of innovative techniques to try to keep people in studies. So um, somebody at Princeton's doing something with cell phones, right? Yeah. Naomi's mm -hmm. doing something, and and so trying to think about ways that you can give people something that they really want that that makes it impossible for them to sort of stay out of touch with you essentially so so i mean some folks are trying that i mean the other thing that people talk about is more frequent interviews so essentially having sort of like touching base interviews uh, along the way because of things like the frequent moves that that mike talked about yesterday I, I mean, those are those are the the only things I can think of. I mean, I should say too that you know it's not just prisoners. I mean, like in Emily talk with how Emily talked about in her in her paper. I mean, it's just vulnerable populations more broadly that that we lose. So I mean, it's actually. I mean, I think maybe the best way to approach it is to try to get people thinking about it more broadly, like Becky mentioned, and and using that as a way to get people to think about how we need to keep people in longitudinal studies. I think Matt, also, oh. I was just going to say too, and I know Natalie knows a lot more, but at least with the Ad Health sample, also identifying people connected to the people that you're following, so having more than one person. And a lot of times it, people are, they're always hard to find, but people who, who use that strategy say sometimes, like some, somebody's keeping track, so not just having one one count a uh, person, but maybe three or four or five, I don't know. And I, I appreciate that. And those are the things that we're doing. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing them Dang. just, we're seeing them for real, just before they get out of prison. We are meeting them at the door. We are giving them cell phones. We're talking to them a week or two afterwards. We're doing face-to-face -face visits. We get two or three contacts before they get out of prison. 
So those of us who are doing this type of research are challenged by that. And we're just, what? Yeah, ask them. Ask them. We're doing home visits. Yes. We haven't gone into hospitals, but we've gone to other prisons. Did you get their Twitter handle? Many times, some of the strategies that I've used because I work with um, heavy uh, injection drug users and um, other um, uh, illicit drug users is getting IRB to do phone surveys over the phone while they're incarcerated. I mean, I, we got an IRB to approve that, and we give them uh, phone cards to talk to their family. Yeah. I mean, because mm -hmm. it is very expensive. Um, home visits, getting multiple people uh, is a lot, is, is multiple uh, family members and friends, getting contacts from those uh, people. Another thing that, a strategy which is very difficult, and you have to have really good outreach people, and I think Emily Wang, what you spoke to in terms of getting formerly incarcerated people and form people who are part of the community really helps with this strategy, is uh, figuring out where they hang out. We, we had really, really good outreach workers that would remember their faces. After you've seen them a couple of times, you know who they are. And so you go to the places where they cop drugs and or where they just hang out on wh whatever they're doing. And, and you are able to say, hey, remember me. And, and a lot of times we were able to, to, um, to reach people in that way. And meeting them where they're at is, is a, a really, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you're probably doing this, but I, I can't say how. Uh, how impactful it was to tell people, okay, we'll just treat you to a meal if you want to go wherever, I hop McDonald's, whatever you want to do, and in, in your neighborhood around your corner, yeah, we'll meet you at this time. Um, being really, really flexible, it, it, it is a beast of a job. I know it, exactly, but I do think that some of the uh, comments that Emily Wang made about us sort of changing the, the IRB procedures to really make it uh, easier to, to, to reach people where they are and to mm -hmm. have this, uh, this, this flexible approach to research um, are really, really needed um, uh, from, a, from an institutional perspective in, in academia, um, because otherwise it's gonna be impossible to reach our most vulnerable populations to engage them into being a part of the research. So thank you. Um, I think we're gonna wrap it up here. This is definitely just the beginning of the conversation, and I think that I'm gonna turn it over now to closing, and we're gonna to try to then broaden it back up to this idea of mass incarceration and population health and see where we can go from here. Thank you very much, panelists.